so I had to go through this sort of a maze to actually get to the right information to connect with this guy. So I, I finally get my information set to him, and I place a phone call to him. I said, Mr. O'Hagan, this is Matt Baldwin. I'm reaching out to you uh, for you know, this information that you got uh, from Jim Bates, this guy's name. And he hangs up the phone and he says, ING's in hiring freeze. Click. What's that all about, right? So I'm sitting in my apartment with my girlfriend at the time, not my wife. And I said, he just hung up the phone. He said, they're in a hiring freeze. I said, what, what's that all about? She said, call back. So I call back and I say, don't hang up the phone, please. You know, I, I sent this information to you. I'm just looking for an internship. I'm not looking for a job. So I keep him on the phone long enough to have a conversation. And we were finding ways to connect. He has a son who's a baseball player in college. He's playing against my in contact with them, you know, hopefully, I would say monthly, if not bi-weekly, just connecting with them, reaching out, how you doing, checking in. So I don't get an internship, right? It's it's this ongoing process. So I'm it's flash forward to the next summer. So I'm literally in the middle of nowhere, British Columbia, and I in like a 30 person town with a, a telephone pole. And I got a calling card and I call my girlfriend to let her know I'm leaving, you know, I'm gonna be gone for 12 days, she's not gonna hear from me. So when I make this phone call, she says, this guy from Ryan G just called, you know, a couple hours ago, and I wanna reach out to him. So I call, it's Mr. O'Hagan, and I uh, call him, he says, you got the internship. I said, well, this isn't a great time, because I'm about to disappear for 12 days. He says, no problem, just, you know, make arrangements to come and do the internship when you get, you know, finish with what you're doing. And so that, I, I had to reschedule my travel, and, uh, you know, make all kinds of arrangements to get a place to stay. I'm, I'm living in Minneapolis at the time that I had to do this internship in Minneapolis. So I rented a room in some woman's home in Minneapolis, and you know everything was on the fly. So you know it's, that was literally the start of my career in the sports business, and that's how it came to pass. So I get this internship after you know a year of communicating with this guy. So it wasn't you know didn't just fall in my lap. I had to pursue it. I had to form a relationship. I had to, you know, persevere through basically being told no. And that's, you know, I think that's a lesson that you all can can learn from, right? That nothing's going to come easy. And if you really want something, you got to go after it. So I do this internship. It was originally supposed to be for eight weeks. It turned into ten weeks. So I come back to law school late, and I made arrangements. School and it was fine. Um, so I, I decided I wanted a job in this profession. Right? I, I, after going through the internship, I liked it. I wanted to pursue it. I saw a need for you know these. There was, there was a hole. I, I saw it. And uh, so I, I go back to school and I'm working, you know, through law school, getting my degree and all that. I don't have a job. You know, I'm, I'm staying in touch with the guy. He's giving me projects. So uh, it comes to like a week before graduation, I get a call and I, I get a job offer. But the job offer is contingent on me passing the Ohio bar exam. So I still don't technically have a job. It was basically a job, but I had to pass the bar. So I you know, go through that process, pass the bar, and it ended up being that it really wasn't a condition. You just kind of made it that way. I had a job before I got my scores back. But, uh, and that's just, you know, that's the way it went. So literally, um, from the moment I learned about this potential opportunity in 2002 to the day that I actually got a job offer in 2004, I mean, that, that was a lot of time and effort and energy that went into even getting a job, right? And I'm not, and I wasn't getting paid a lot of money when I started. You know, I was getting 35 grand or whatever. But it, you, you had the opportunity to get into the business. And that's really the key. Once you start, you can grow from there. And so then I'm in the business, right? There's no training program. No one teaches you how to do what you're going to do. They literally throw you in the fire. And you sink or swim. So I started this business, uh, ING, which is a mega agency, you know, worldwide agency, 
tons of clients, big, big name people. And we have seven NFL head coaches and a host of other NCAA coaches. Uh, basketball and football at the time. So this is August of 04 when I started. So the season is in full swing in football. So by the time the football season ended in, oh, in early 05, we had one NFL head coach. And I'm sitting here thinking, what the hell happened? Pardon my, what happened? How did that happen? How do we go from seven to one? And there was no answer, right? I just, I lived through this. I see this happening, and I have to say, okay, what do we do to fix this? How do we, how do we regroup? How do we grow this thing back up to where it was? And literally just start picking up the phone and making phone calls and sending out, you know, blind emails and just trying to network through the relationships that I had through playing football, through you know, the people that I knew in the business, just networking. And we ended up, we had 40 clients total or so, 45 clients when we started. By the time I left in 2010, we had 100. And we buoyed the business back up to where it was before this, this collapse in early 05. So again, it's, you know, what do you do when bad things happen? How do you react? Do you, do you wilt? Do you say, this is over, can't do it? Or do you pick yourself up, find a way to get it done? And I think, you know, going back to playing football here, the, the lessons I learned and you know, Fred and from my teammates, teachers here at the school, is you pick yourself up off the mat and you keep going. You find a way. You find a way to get it done. Don't quit. Never quit. And that's how I really lived my life. So by the time I left ING in 2010, I, that, this was the part that gets a little dark for me. Right, so I built this business up at IG, and I'm not getting credit for it. Right, I mean my boss is he's taking all the credit. And, you know, that's, he's entitled to do whatever he wants. He's, he's, he's the president. Right, he's the president of this business. But I'm really frustrated, right, because I know the work that I'm putting in. So I get an opportunity to leave to go to another agency. I get an opportunity to go to CAA, Creative Artists Agency, which is a huge entertainment agency startup as a uh, movie, excuse me, was a uh, movie business, and then they got into the sports business, and they got into the sports business through acquisitions of IMG people. So when I when I started at IMG in before, the founder of the company was still alive. His name was Mark McCormick. He's written a host of books. Uh, one of them was actually a great book. You guys have read his stuff. Uh, Everything is something along the lines of uh, what they don't teach you at Harvard Business School. It's a great book. You should read it. But anyway, he was the, he was the founder and owner of IMG, passed away. And when he died, he gave, his, he gave the company to his children through a trust. And the children decided they didn't want it. So they sold the company. They put it up for sale. This guy in New York buys it, named Ted Forsman. And when he bought the company, he fired a key executive, chief operation officer, a guy named Peter Johnson. And it was trimming the fat. This stuff happens when you know acquisitions you know, occur, mergers and acquisitions. They cut people. They try to restructure businesses the way they put the new owner wants it. Well, the one interesting thing about this Peter Johnson fellow is that he was a key man in the business. So like all these agents like Tom Condon, you may have heard of, uh, Casey Close, the baseball agent, Pat Brisson, the hockey agent, very high power, famous agents. They had key man clauses in their contracts and tied them to Peter Johnson. So when Peter Johnson was fired, they became essentially free agents. They could move their business to wherever they wanted. All their clients, they built them in, they basically left and formed CAA sports. <laughs> So, I'm again sitting at IG and watching this all happen, and I didn't have the same benefit in my contract, right? So, I'm stuck. So, they started talking to me though about 2008, 2009, and then eventually moved in 2010. So, again, it was probably about a two year period of discussion about you know, coming on board with them. They wanted me to run their coach to business, or they actually work with them another guy named co-director of their coach's business. So their strategy for me, though, was not as clean as what 
they had it themselves. They, they wanted me to basically file a lawsuit against my company and say my B clause is invalid and I can take all my clients. <coughs> so I agreed to do this because I was you know, young and, and dumb and, and frustrated. And you know, a lot of emotion was kicked up. And I agreed to this plan. And it was a big mistake. So I get in this lawsuit, I file this lawsuit against IMG in California. Uh, they turn around and sue me in Ohio. So I'm in the middle of multi-state litigation. And it's me versus IMG. It's not CAA versus IMG, it's Matt Ball versus IMG. So you can imagine which side had the deeper pockets, right? And, it wasn't. and uh, it, it, was, it was crazy. So then they went on a PR campaign against me. They started throwing all kinds of you know, allegations about me out in the media. The Wall Street Journal I was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. The Sports Business Journal had all kinds of things said, none of which were true, but you know, it's the court of public opinion. So they, they fought that war, and you know, I I always known who I was, and I started reading these articles that they put out, and got in the Twilight Zone. So anyway, this PR campaign that they waged against me goes to CAA, the group that was had hired me, and they decide they don't want to be aligned with me anymore, so they let me go. Uh, actually, they, they claimed that I was insubordinate, and they kicked me to the curb. So I'm out of a job, I'm in the middle of multi-state litigation, Pretty dark times. I mean, could easily quit, could easily pull up my tent and went home. But I decided during that process that I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna quit. I was gonna push through. I wasn't gonna let these guys say I couldn't do what I wanted to do. And so I stayed in the litigation. I uh, talked to my lawyers. They got a word from Creative Artists Agency that they were gonna stop paying the bill. And these were expensive New York City lawyers, you know, thousand dollars an hour type lawyers. And uh, so I made a deal with them that you know they would represent me pro bono, meaning for free, through summary judgment, which is a pre-trial judgment. And if I won on summary judgment, I'd, I'd win. And if I didn't, then I'd have to get another lawyer who would have to pay. So we go through the summary judgment process and. Uh, the judge calls the lawyers the night before he's going to issue a ruling and says he's going to rule in my favor, bless the Lord. And that enabled us to settle. So I reached a settlement with IMG, which got out of the lawsuit, and tried to move on with my life. So after that, you know, I was, you know, shell shocked, admittedly. A lot of, uh, a lot of long, long nights and, you know, dark days. But I picked up the phone and I reached out to three other agencies that I respected through my work at IMG. And I spoke to all of them and I you know, pursued positions with them. And in one of them, I ended up getting a job with them. And the, the job I got was with a guy named Bob Lamar, who was literally the founder of the business that I can coaches representation business. He founded it in 1978. And he's the godfather. You know, he's, he's John Green's agent. He's Andy Reid's agent. He's, you know, Mike Holmgren is where it all started. And I was the, I ended up being the first person to work with him, you know, at his side, right hand man, for five years. He never had another person to work with him. And it was interesting because it was the same type of situation that I encountered when I was at IMG, his business was sort of waning, right? It was guys were getting older, some guys had retired, some guys had passed away. So his client roster was maybe 30 guys, and there wasn't a lot of youth in it. So I again came in and uh, utilized my relationships to help it grow. And by the time I left, we had 75 clients. And he's got some of the hottest, you know, Young stars in the coaching profession now, and Sean McVay, who was a relationship that I brought in and helped him get better. But during that process, what I realized is 
there were things that were going on in the business that I didn't personally like. And I wanted to do it differently. I wanted to set a different tone, set a different message. And I go back to one of the key you know, components of St. John's, which is you know, we are men for others. And that's something that's always stuck with me, and I'm sure it'll stick with you all as well as you grow and, and move forward in your lives. And what I found in this business that I'm in is it became very, I, I noticed it being very selfish. It wasn't about helping other people. It was about money. It was about power. It was about control. And to get that, people would cut corners. Right? They would lie. They would cheat. They would steal. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get on board with it. So I decided to leave the agency that I was with, Bob Lamont, and I went out on my own. I formed my own business. So I left the mega ship, right? The most powerful coaches agency in the world. And I opened up my own shop with zero. Nothing. No money, no clients, nothing. So I took a huge risk. But I found myself that if you set the proper, you know, platform, philosophy, protocol, you're going to be able to grow. And sure enough, by, you know, a year into being on my own, with, you know, some learning and growing pains along the way, grew a client base of roughly 50 people, you know, 45 to 50 people. So, I'm sitting, you know, around my, is it an offer? I spoke in a shop with an offer. So, I get a phone call out of the blue from a friend of mine, Jason Lott, before I was for CBS. Good friend. And he says, uh, you know, I just got a call from Joel Siegel. Joel's looking to grow a coach's business. He doesn't have one. He said, he's looking for the top young guy in the business. And I told him you, would you be interested in talking to him? I said, sure. And what the heck, I'll have a conversation. And so, you know, I got a phone Joel, and we hit it off. And I really like him. You know, we're, we got a shared philosophy. He approached the business the same way that I do. And next thing I know, it, it makes sense to me to you know, have, allow him to acquire my business. If he wants to acquire, I say yes. So he presented the opportunity, and I agreed. And I've been with him ever since. It's been three years, going on three years. And it's, it's amazing to, to me to look at the opportunity that I have now with Joel and how he is as a person. As a, as a man and as a, you know, his principles, his principles are, are shared with mine. And I would have never gotten to this point if I hadn't gone through this tough stuff, right? If I hadn't learned what I liked, what I didn't, what I agreed with, what I didn't agree with. You, you have to go through, you know, the battles to get to where you want to go. Uh, a friend of mine was a, went to a Catholic school in Minneapolis, and he's had kind of a father at his, his high school that said, show me your scars. Now, I, don't, I don't care about all the good things that happened to you. Tell me what, tell me what you've been through. Show me your scars. And I think, you know, as you guys grow up and you start learning about life outside of, you know, when you get away from your parents and you start going out on your own, life is, is going to, you're going to get scarred up, but that's a good thing. Don't be afraid of getting scars. Cherish them. Learn from them. Let them, let them grow you. Let them mold you. It's, it's how you get better. It's how you learn, you know, who you are and what you want. And I think, you know, again, getting to where I've gotten today, you know, with, with this business that I'm representing and people that I work with, I would not be in this position had I not gotten, you know, bruised up. And uh, it's it's been a, it's been a heck of a ride, and I really I really can't tell you enough. It's, don't be afraid of taking risks. You know, care about people. No relationships matter. Anytime you see something, you know, that looks like an opportunity, work at it. You know, don't just let it go. Nothing's going to happen to you overnight. You're going to have to work. You're going to have to work to get what you want. And I think, you know, it's, it's all good. So, I mean, 
happy to answer any questions that you guys have.
is the most scary thing against or with being legally questionable? For God?